Hello and welcome to Sacred Psychology, the podcast for misfits and mystics. Here, neuroscience and spirituality go hand in hand. Join me, Tamara Powell, on a no holds barred adventure outside the box, because that's where all the truly great shit happens anyway. Welcome back to Sacred Psychology. I'm your host, Tamara Powell. This is the podcast where we explore mind, body, and spirit, but especially from a psychological perspective. Today's guest, Amanda Laird, is taking us into a topic many of you haven't given much of a second thought to, but you probably should, and that is your menstrual health. I promise it is so much more than you think. But before we dive into that, Let me just say, there's only a couple more weeks and less than 15 spots left in the sanctuary. We kick off this incredible sacred journey in February. If you're feeling like you've hit a plateau in life, business, or personal and spiritual development, or if you're ready to stop overthinking, overdoing, and overcompensating for being who you really are, you need, need to learn what I call radical autonomy. Join me and an incredible team of world-renowned experts and a mastermind of soul sisters in the sanctuary. Here's what one former member, Julie, had to say about her experience. She says, I felt disconnected from myself. I was so caught up in everyday responsibilities like working, exercising, cooking, cleaning, meal prep, etc., and in the concerns of others that I was forgetting to be present in my own life. Being in the sanctuary has provided me with a sacred space to dive deeper into the wildness that is me on the weekly basis, alongside the experts and professionals with the knowledge to guide me in the right direction. I'm finding my purpose and my voice in the trenches with other women that want to do the work, the real work. I have this new fiery energy because every week in the sanctuary, we take the time to peel back the layers of garbage that no longer serves us and toss it. I've always known that I was capable of achieving anything I wanted to, but now I feel it in my body. There is a difference between knowing something is theoretically possible and actually feeling it. Feeling the fierceness in your body makes it tangible, something you can reach out and grab. I opted in to the inner sanctum, which gave me a space to normalize and strengthen my intuitive gifts in a way I really didn't think was possible. I'm now comfortable with them, and I have stopped wasting time second-guessing myself and have learned to use them to my advantage. I am halfway through the program, and I have found the inspiration to believe in myself, to start my own business with my creative passions at the forefront. I can't wait to see what the other half brings. The sanctuary is church for the wild woman. Mm, Love that. And I couldn't agree more. So if you're interested, head on over to ariatherapy.com forward slash the sanctuary. And I'll have a link to that in the show notes. I can't wait to see you there. And now on with today's episode. My guest is Amanda Laird. She's a feminist holistic nutritionist specializing in menstrual health. She helps people understand their menstrual cycles and have better periods without defaulting to hormonal birth control. Keyword defaulting. It's only an answer for some of us. Amanda is also the host of the Heavy Flow podcast and author of Heavy Flow, Breaking the Curse of Menstruation, which comes out really soon. So you're going to want to get on the list for pre-orders. Like she says, her mission is to break the supposed curse of menstruation so that you can have a shame-free, painless period. Yep, I said painless. Also, to understand your menstrual cycle and have agency over your own body and to make truly informed decisions about sex, birth control, and your health. Guys, I was blown away by the depth and breadth of Amanda's knowledge and the time topics through which she covers. You do not want to miss this one. So without further ado, I give you the one, the only, the ever incomparable Amanda Laird. Hey, Amanda, welcome to the show. 
Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh, this is going to be a super fun topic that I think a lot of people are already going, what? Why are we talking about this? Which to me further, you know, emphasizes the why. This is exactly why we got to talk about this because people find it odd. Absolutely. So tell my listeners a little bit about you and how you got into the subject of menstruation and health, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. So I am a registered holistic nutritionist and I specialize in menstrual and hormonal health. Mm -hmm. And I talk about periods every week on my podcast, the Heavy Flow podcast. And I also wrote a book called Heavy Flow, Breaking the Curse of Menstruation, which will be out in early 2019. Awesome. And I like to say that I am, I was kind of born a period person. (laughs) So as long as I can remember, I was always super interested in sex and reproductive health and just health in general. And, you know, I was always the friend who could answer your questions about your period or I have a yeast infection. What do I do? Or my period is late. And I've just always really been interested in that side of things. And when I went to holistic nutrition school, I really started to specialize my studies into hormonal health. And it was there that I discovered that your period didn't have to be a curse, right? That just because things like cramps or headaches are common, that doesn't make them normal. Mm. And I knew that when I was done school and I started working with clients, I really wanted to specialize in period stuff, fertility and all that stuff. And then I started working as a holistic nutritionist. And I noticed that when I was working with clients, we were spending more time talking about how your menstrual cycle works and why it's important, and how it's a vital sign, and less time about here are the types of foods and habits that we can put into place to have a better period. Because nobody even understood why their menstrual cycle is such an important vital sign to their overall health and wellness. Mm -hmm. And when I really started to trace that red thread back and think about why is it just not, it's not just one client, it's all my clients, right? Mm -hmm. And what did I learn about menstruation when I was growing up? And where are the gaps in our education and our knowledge coming from? And that's when I really started to see that, you know, this ignorance that we all seem to have about our menstrual cycles was a big issue. And that's when I launched Heavy Flow so that I could start talking about it and breaking, breaking the curse. Yeah. You know, speaking of your, your podcast, I wanted to get into this a little later, but this is the perfect segue. I was thinking, wow, an entire podcast devoted to this topic. How much could there be to talk about? And then I'm, as, as I'm scrolling through your episodes, I was like, holy shit. No, there's a lot to talk about. Absolutely. And You know, I will say that it's been about 18 months since I started working on the project. Mm -hmm. And in that time, I also wrote my book. And when I first started, you know, I really thought that the podcast was going to be about very narrow focused on nutrition, right? Um, And here's how we can have a better period. And this is why your period is important to your health and wellness. But as I really dug into this, topic, I have seen that it's, it intersects Mm -hmm. with so many other issues, particularly in the cultural issue and like the social justice issue too, because it intersects with gender, it intersects with class, it intersects with accessibility. And, you know, we've been, as of us recording this, I think I'm around 50 episodes, 50 standalone episodes. And I feel like I've only scratched the surface. (laughs) Which just, again, proves the point that there's so much that we are not even considering and much less talking about and getting active to champion for. Like one of your episode titles, I had to giggle and then cheer, you know, clinical gender bias in the gyno ghetto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that encompasses four of the topics that you just listed all in one spot. 
and the reading about how Toronto, right, just had their inaugural menstrual hygiene day. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. We could use that here in the States as well. And tell me about some of the negative reaction that I was reading about on the blog and why this is such an important thing. Yeah, so that was um, really exciting. Um, And I worked with my cycle sister, as I like to call her, uh, Jana Gerdeskis, who runs um, a nonprofit here in Toronto called The Period Purse. And they help to distribute menstrual products to people in shelters and on the streets who might not otherwise be able to afford them. And, you know, this (laughs) <laughs> the blowback, it was really interesting watching on Twitter the response to our mayor tweeting out his declaration Yeah, um, that it was Metral Hygiene Day. And there were all kinds of responses, things like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. Now I've seen everything. Oh my gosh, this is disgusting. Oh my gosh, this is insulting, right? And those are insulting. kind of insulting. The, ta- the tame what? versions, right? Yeah. And... That really, I think, shines a light on why a day like Menstrual Hygiene Day, which is a global initiative, and it's been around for several years now, an organization called Wash United uh, started started, um, Menstrual Hygiene Day as an awareness day to bring some awareness to the issues around access to products, to clean water, to privacy, particularly in places like Africa and Asia, India, where they just don't have, you know, the seemingly never-ending supply of menstrual products, right, Right. that we have here. And we have clean water and we we have public restrooms at school and at work to change our pads or tampons. And the reason why Jana and I felt that it was important to champion this in Toronto was because when you think about a lack of access to menstrual products – you tend to think of Africa or India, right? Mm -hmm. And in reality, even I'm in Toronto, here in North America, in the UK, in Australia, access to menstrual products is still a huge issue. And there are people out there that simply can't afford to buy them. And if you've never been faced with that choice of not being able to purchase pads or tampons or having to use an old rag or newspapers or a sock or any number of the kind of like makeshift mm. products that you can read about people people using, then you really take it for granted. And you don't realize that if you don't have a way to manage your menstrual blood, you might not go to school right. or you might not be able to go to work or you might not be able to go to a skill training where you could get a better job, right? It just perpetuates the whole problem. Absolutely. And so it was really important to Jana and I to bring this to Toronto City Council to really highlight that this isn't an issue that's far away. It happens right here at home, and it happens more often than anybody probably even thinks or realizes. Yeah, I would definitely assume that. I am just guilty as every other, I'm assuming, cisgendered, white, privileged woman of not necessarily assuming that, you know, seven or eight dollars for a box of tampons or pads is within the realm of accessibility for people. Absolutely. And, you know, if you have a heavy flow, Mm -hmm. then you could be using, you know, several products a day. And so it's not just a seven or eight dollar box. It's two or three boxes, right, over the course of your flow. Um, And if you are a mother of daughters who have periods, now you need to purchase products for all of you, right? Yep. (laughs) So, yeah, it is, it's not, it's not just, it's not just seven or eight dollars. And in Canada, back in 2015, we abolished our sales tax, Mm. on menstrual products. Well done. And in the U.S., it's it's a state-by-state mm-hmm. fight. And so as we're recording this, you just had your midterm elections and Nevada um, had a ballot. Uh, on the, the ballot in Nevada was to remove the tax on menstrual products. And it was voted yes. Oh, Nevada. So, yeah, so t- times are changing in the U.S. as well. But what is sales tax? 
right? Mm -hmm. Like in Canada, it's 13%. So that's really not, but even still 13%. That's an extra dollar or two. Mm -hmm. That really is not making the difference of making them affordable or not. Right. Right. And, you know, my, the other side of this coin for me too is yes, we all deserve to be able to manage our menstrual cycles, have something to mop Mm -hmm. up the blood, Mm -hmm. but that's also not enough for me. We also have to understand our menstrual cycles. We also have to start to look at why is this even an issue? Like why are people so afraid of smelling like menstrual blood or Mm -hmm. having a a menstrual stain, blood stain on their pants? Mm -hmm. Why Why is that so shameful? that somebody would miss school or work. You know, it's funny. It's like, I honestly can't even answer that for myself, but it's there. And I think it goes back all the way to elementary school with what we're first hearing about it and the way that we're first hearing about it. Right. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, particularly in our culture, in, in media and in advertisements, you know, menstruation is rarely if ever portrayed as something positive, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's usually if somebody is menstruating on a television show, it's, or in a movie, it's usually kind of to excuse her bitchy behavior or uh, to be the brunt of a joke. Right. And so these portrayals of menstruation as a negative thing are really just perpetuating that shame and that taboo. Absolutely. My, this is so timely for me because my youngest who is now 13 just got her first period and the questions that naturally came up, you know, hers lasted longer than her sister's and why is that a thing? And is there something wrong with her that it's this color versus this color? And I thought, man, they did not, even though, you know, I specialize in sex and gender and we talk about it plenty at our house and I'm glad that she feels comfortable talking about it with me. I, it just proves the point though, that they weren't also talking about it in health class and that she doesn't feel comfortable talking about it with her friends and, Mm. you know, being terrified that there was going to be a blood stain before she got home to access something, you know, made my little mama heart go out to her. And I thought, why is this a problem? Why don't they have this available even in like middle school bathrooms? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, we talk about oftentimes when we talk about access to products, Mm -hmm. it's within like the shelter system, right? right? And reaching people who are in that system, but absolutely it should be, well, I mean, in my My perfect world. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. In my dream, my perfect world is you walk into any bathroom, any public restroom, regardless of gender. Well, if this is my perfect world, there are no gendered bathrooms, but um, (laughs) any bathroom you walk into has menstrual products available. You know, somebody somewhere decided that there are certain items that must be available in a public washroom, right? Mm Mm-hmm. You have toilet paper, you have soap, you have running water, and you have paper towels or you have a hand dryer to dry your hands after you wash them. So why are menstrual products not included in that list? Right. I mean, women have been bleeding since women have existed. So Absolutely. Not a new issue. And you know, none of us would exist if women didn't bleed. Exactly. So yeah, it's absolutely not a new issue where I think what I think that is reflective of is who is it that's making these decisions, right? Mm. And the people who make made these decisions however long ago that in a public restroom we're going to have these things available, they probably didn't menstruate. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> and once you start to look through what Jennifer Weiss-Wolf, she's an amazing um, activist and writer and uh, lawyer mm-hmm. who does has done amazing work around menstrual equity. She calls it the menstrual lens. And when you start to look at different policies and you start to look in different places and you apply this menstrual lens, you will see that it's not just public restrooms. Like there's a lot of places in our world that just are not designed to accommodate the ebbs and flows of a menstruating person. Yes. I love it. So 
Let's go back though to grade school. Where do you think we are falling short with educating our elementary schoolers and helping them prepare for reproductive health? Hmm, that's a great question. You know, I I feel like we are at a time in history where most of us have at least learned about what our period is mm-hmm. before we get it, right? So that is at least a win. You hope, yes. right? Yes, yes. And so whether you learned about it in school or you learned about it from an older sibling or your mom or from television, most of us have heard of a period. So that's good. Where I think that we are falling short is putting it only in the context of fertility. And I certainly remember, you know, my sex ed, and I took sex ed in the 90s. So basically, the thesis of my sex education class was don't get pregnant and don't get AIDS. Yep, us too. In the 80s. (laughs) Still the same thing. Early (laughs) Early 90s. And... So this idea, so, you know, I do think that young people need to be aware that once you start menstruating, this means that you could get pregnant Mm -hmm. and there are responsibilities around that. But by only putting it in that context of fertility, I think is really doing a disservice to an adolescent girl or or an adolescent Mm -hmm. They might not identify as a girl. Good point. And, you know, it's scary. And I remember, you know, when I was 13, 14 years old, like this idea of getting pregnant, I was so afraid of getting pregnant. And it, it, but that's, that's not helpful, right? Right. That's not helpful. And when we focus the conversation too much around, well, now this means that you could get pregnant. And we also don't tell a young person that, but this also means that, you know, your bones are going to get stronger or you're going to get to build more muscles or you can be more creative and you can tap into your creativity. Or now you might find that your mood's fluctuate and some days you might feel great and happy and other days you might turn inwards and feel more just you know feel a little bit lower energy or lower mood right and certainly I know I spend a lot of my life thinking that there was something wrong with me because I would be up and down right mm-hmm. and there were weeks of my of the month where I just felt amazing. And I like to, now that I know that that was probably my follicular phase of my menstrual cycle where I had rising hormones on my side and lots of energy, I like to call that the Beyonce phase where (laughs) I, you know, just feel like every decision I've ever made in life was the right one. And, you know, I'm feeling so amazing. Mm -hmm. And then two weeks later, suddenly I wake up and it's like, I'm awful. I'm terrible. I can't do anything right. I'm so tired. I can't stick to healthy eating. All I want to do is eat chips and watch sad movies. And Mm -hmm. if I had known that I'm not going to feel exactly the same every single day of my cycle, maybe I would have had a little bit more self-compassion. Yeah. And then that brings me to one of my favorite words, right? Of agency. You talk about how, you know, your mission being to break the curse of menstruation. And one of the reasons to understand your menstrual cycle is that you can have agency over your body. And so when knowing when certain hormone levels are dropping and certain cravings are increasing and the why, in my opinion, helps you. I mean, you may still reach for the chips, but you'll at least be knowing why your body supposedly wants the thing. Absolutely. Right. And you know, we live in a, a culture that really um, devalues body literacy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, how many people have gone to the doctor because something just hasn't felt right to them and they're completely dismissed by a doctor? All the time. And particularly around reproductive health and yes, menstrual ma'am. health. That happens time and time and time and time again. That's the guy no ghetto, right? Yes. And... You know, I really, as a holistic practitioner, you know, I really value that connection between mind and body, and I'll even say spirit. Yes, please. Because 
it, that is valuable. And our bodies are sending us signals and our bodies are talking to us all the time. But traditionally, we're not taught how to get those, receive those messages. We're not taught to listen to them. And if we, oftentimes, if we do, sh if we are getting messages from our body and we're sharing them, particularly with conventional medical doctors, we're dismissed. Which brings me to another point. And I think something that you speak to quite frequently, I, you know, when a teenager or even a young adult woman starts complaining about her periods aren't feeling right. There's a super heavy flow. It's painful. She might have endometriosis, PCOS, et cetera. Instantly, the reaction is, here's some pills. Mm -hmm. Here's hormones for your hormones. And while I'm not necessarily completely against the idea, it just still feels very, you know, whitewashed, male-driven. <laughs> have yes. some pills. You'll, you'll feel better. And then we lead to a whole host of other problems. So can you speak to that a little bit, why that should not just naturally be our first go-to, if that is even your opinion? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I definitely, I agree with you. I always love to kind of premise mm -hmm. this conversation with just the caveat that I'm not anti-birth control. I'm not anti-pill. You know, I benefited for many years for taking birth, hormonal birth control, mm -hmm. and it's important that we have, to use your word, agency yeah. over our own bodies to decide when or if we want to have a child. So I'm definitely not anti-birth control by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. We definitely need options. But I do agree that quite often, you know, if you go to your doctor for any number of reasons related to menstruation, whether that's pain or irregularities or heavy flow, chances are you're going to be given a prescription for hormonal contraception. Yep. And particularly for young people who are in their teen years, it actually takes several years for your hormones to sort themselves out and for you to be cycling regularly. So Pain, okay, so pain is one thing, okay, which we can come back to that in a, middle, in a minute, but in general, you know, the first couple of years that you get your period, it's not unusual for it to be irregular, which I know that's annoying, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because especially as a young person, if you've got a lot on your plate and if you're doing activities, you know, I 100%, I quit figure skating because wearing a pad in a spandex oh, I bet. skirt was just not my favorite pastime. Mm. But, you know, young people have, their, have lives going on, so it's inconvenient to have irregular periods. But that's totally normal. And up until like 19 or 20, actually, it's normal for periods to be a little bit wonky, even a little bit heavier, too. So generally, your flow can start to get a little bit less, too by the time that you hit 19. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because your hormones need to sort themselves out. So what's happening when we are taking hormonal contraception, and certainly I know the line that I was given um, and that I understood, uh, how I understood hormonal contraception worked for a long time was that it makes your body think that you're pregnant, right. and so therefore you don't get your period, which isn't essentially, that's not actually accurate. What actually happens is that when you take hormonal contraception, you're taking synthetic hormones, which are going to suppress your menstrual cycle. And if we did want to compare it to a bodily function, it would actually be closer to menopause because your body is not ovulating. Your body is not cy cycling. So those ebbs and flows and those up and down of the hormones that we were chatting about earlier is replaced with a steady stream flat line of hormone. And I mean, the good thing is you're not going to get pregnant, right? If you don't want to be, but the trade-off, um, particularly if, you know, your periods were wonky, your endocrine system hadn't matured when you start taking hormonal contraception, when you go off of them, mm -hmm. whether because now you want to be pregnant 
or you just, you know, maybe it doesn't fit with your lifestyle or your choices, or you just, it's not working for you. You're experiencing a lot of other side effects, which is something I hear about every day as well. What can happen is your periods are the same as they were when you were a teenager, right? Mm, yeah. You've got these heavy, erratic, wonky cycles, right? Because instead of actually regulating your period, and I'm using like little bunny quotes yeah. here, mm -hmm. um, instead of regulating your period, it just shut it down. So then when you restart it again, well, A, if you can get it restarted, because something else that is very common is once you stop taking hormonal contraception, you don't even get a period or it can take a long time for your body to start cycling and to start mm -hmm. ovulating again. And sometimes they're, they're the same as they were before you turned it off. And so instead of addressing the root cause, because often as a holistic nutritionist, what I work with my clients to identify is the hormonal imbalances that are causing these symptoms, right? So what's mm -hmm. causing the irregular period? Why aren't you ovulating regularly? Why are your periods too, too heavy? Why are they too long? Why are they too short? Why are your cycles too short? Because your period is a vital sign. And not just your period, I should say your menstrual cycle is a vital sign. And it's a picture of our overall health and wellness. So if something is out of balance inside our body, particularly with our hormones, that's going to show up in our periods. And that's where those symptoms that often come will show up. Yeah. And that, like you said, can create a whole host of other issues that women, I just don't think are completely prepared for. Um, I remember being 16 and complaining about heavy flow. And that was the first thing that they gave me was orthotricycline. They were like, here you go. Here's your little pack. Take this. And it certainly helped. And I was one of the fortunate ones that did not have long-term side effects when I later chose to have babies, I don't know, about seven, eight years later. But a lot of my friends did. And that was, you know, also fascinating to hear the different versions that we'd all gotten from our doctors mm -hmm. and how wide and varied they were going to be. Some of us were told, like myself, you know, it could take you up to six months to get a regular period and to be able to get pregnant again. And others, it was several years. Others were told there was not going to be an issue. You were going to be just fine. Which leads me to another fascinating thing that I'm sure you've talked about. I remember after I was no, in between my two daughters, both of them were planned. I didn't want to go back on birth control. I had that, I forget what you call it, but after, when you're on the, I wanted a nurse. And so I took the mini pill, right, uh -huh. after I had a baby. And Lord, that made me freaking crazy. <laughs> not, what's the term that you used for that? Shit, you had it on. It's one of your episodes is about that. It was like the syndrome that post-birth oh, control. Oh, post post-birth mm -hmm. post control syndrome. Yeah. Yep. 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 Had that big time, big mood swings. And so I was researching my options and my mom in her time, 20, 30 years before that used the diaphragm. Yeah. So here, right. I loved it. I walked in though to this military clinic, Air Force clinic and asked them for one. You would have thought girl that I asked them to bring me an alien. They <laughs> had almost the nurse had no idea I had to go talk to the doctor and here I swear they brought me this, these boxes that had like six layers of dust on them <laughs> not been touched in forever and he was like are you sure like we have to do a fitting for that and I'm like whatever it takes like let's go but that was one of the best decisions that I had made and it was I almost felt self-conscious and embarrassed by the time we were done because they were acting like it was the craziest requests that they'd had, you know, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I did not want to just stay on the mini pill. I wanted to be able to have more agency once again. Well, absolutely. You know, a fantastic book about hormonal birth control is a book called Sweetening the Pill, uh, which is by Holly Griggs Ball. And she's been on my podcast and she's just an incredible advocate for options, right? Mm -hmm. And what she writes about in her book is that you know, we have this illusion of choice when it comes to birth control because, you know, you go to your doctor and the options that are given to you are the patch, the ring, 
the hormonal IUD, you could take right. the pill, and you could take an injection. And so that feels like choice, right? And even within all of those choices, there's all kinds of different brands that have their own little cocktail right. of hormones. And so, you know, I, I know certainly as a young woman, I really felt like satisfied. Like I have a lot of choice here, but really there are so many other forms of contraception beyond birth control, like birth control pills or hormonal contraception that are also effective, right? You have the Mm -hmm. diaphragm, you can use a cervical cap, condoms, like Mm -hmm. what's wrong with a condom, right? right? Nothing. They're actually very, very effective. But we're told our boyfriends won't like us if we make them use one. Right? Absolutely. And you also have to... You need to be charting. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) That's how my parents had me. (laughs) Exactly. So there's other options that are available. But, you know, going back to how our sex education is really failing young people, right, Mm -hmm. is we are framing menstruation or menstrual cycles only within the context of fertility, number one. And then number two, we are putting the fear of God into them around getting pregnant. Right. And I also feel like we have this idea that, you know, menstrual cycles are difficult to figure out, right? And uh, your (laughs) dumb little lady brain Mm -hmm. can't even begin to wrap your head around how intricate the body, like how intricate and complicated the body is. So just take this pill and then you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, certainly I, I, I mean, I always feel like this conversation can be taken out of context in so many ways. So I just have to repeat myself time and time again that, you know what? Yes, there's lots of good reasons to take hormonal contraception, right? Like if you are a teenager and you absolutely do not want to become pregnant, it can be a good option. If you have a partner who's, you know, maybe you're in an abusive relationship or you're in a partner who's not cooperative for whatever reason, you know, these are good reasons. Or because right. you've done all your research and you decide that, yes, this is the best option for you, then take the pill. My issue is, though, is that we're making these decisions without being fully informed, Mm -hmm. right? And if we don't understand how our menstrual cycle works, we don't understand that ovulation is an essential bodily function that isn't just about releasing an egg, but has, you know, countless benefits to our brain, to our bone health, to our heart health, to our mood, to our sleep. If we don't understand that, then we don't understand how the pill works and we don't understand the consequences of essentially castrating ourselves right? because that's what's suppressing ovulation, yeah. right? If we don't understand those consequences, are we truly making a decision? And like what good is our choice between the hormonal IUD and the pill or the ring or whatever if we don't even understand the consequences. And when I say consequences, I'm not talking about, you know, the small risk of stroke or blood clots or, you know, a slight increase in breast cancer that might come from using these things. It's the consequences of turning off a bodily function. And the reality is we don't know. Mm -hmm. We don't know. And like when I, I went on hormonal contraception When I was a teenager, I was 16 or so, I think. And, you know, my mom was comfortable with that because she had taken birth control for a few years between her pregnancies. And she never had side effects. Right. It wasn't an issue. But that was for a few years between pregnancies, right? Like, I was on it for 12 plus years. I know lots of women who've taken the pill for 15 years, for 20 years. Now the pill is being prescribed right into menopause. Right. And what are the effects of that? We don't, we just don't know. Like this is a humongous, uncontrolled experiment that we are in the midst of. And we don't know what the long-term lasting effects are going to be. It's powerful. It's definitely plenty to consider for sure about how much choice do we really have and are we exercising the best choice for us? 
And why do we assume that it's so complicated and put this trust in our doctors? I have a colleague who um, is finishing her PhD in basically statistical psychology, and that is her dissertation area of study is how do people come to make their medical decisions? Ooh, that's fascinating. I want her on my podcast. Yeah, I will totally (laughs) get you her her information. And she has endometriosis, and so this is definitely a hot button issue for her. But it does make you think, like, what makes someone choose to vaccinate or not vaccinate, to take the pill or not take the pill, to take acai berries, which I think can be amazing, but instead of, you know, different medication. Which brings me to something else that you do as a holistic nutritionist. Talk to me about, you know, the fact that we can even eat properly for our menstruation and perhaps help decrease some of these quote unquote side effects that we're experiencing. Yes. So as a nutritionist, I am equally as passionate about this side of the conversation as I am around the politics and the culture Mm -hmm. side. And this conversation always comes with a caveat too. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) Is that like, you know, I'm a nutritionist, so certainly I believe in the power of food and what we're putting into our body, you know, that we are what we eat, right? Mm -hmm. The food that we eat makes our hormones and our cells and it's the building blocks for our bodies. At the same time, I'm also realistic and particularly when it comes to, you know, something like endometriosis or adenomyosis, which are, you know, serious issues, right. food might be able to help you manage your symptoms, but it's not necessarily going to cure you or it's not going to take it away. Now, that said, there's no reason not to try because it could help to manage your symptoms. So when it comes to food, there are lots of things that we can do to help support our hormonal health, right? So it's not just about periods. We have to look at our hormonal health from a big picture because our hormones, we have like over 50 different hormones in our body. They're in every organ, every body system, um, every cell in our body, like it works because of hormones. Hormones are the chemical messengers that tell your body what to do, Um, or helps your organs talk to each other. And they're like an orchestra, right? Beautiful analogy. When one of them is out of tune, that's going to throw the whole band off, right? Mm -hmm. And so we need to be looking holistically at our overall hormonal health. And if I was going to give people one thing Mm -hmm. when it comes to food, It's taking a look at inflammation in our body and inflammatory foods that we are guilty. (laughs) You know what? And then I complain. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't even want to say, like, I hate, it breaks my heart to say, to hear you say that you feel guilty. Because the reality is, as well, that stress is, and this was going to be my second point, Mm -hmm. which is that stress is actually even more important, I would say, than diet Mm. and food. And a study came out, I think it was last year or the year before, a recent study came out that looked at the effects of stress on our dietary choices. And there was two groups of people, people who were very stressed out and eating what they called a healthy diet and people who had less (laughs) stress and were eating like a standard American diet. Yep. And the people who were less stressed but were eating shitty food Mm -hmm. had better health markers. And so stress is going to undo all your... (laughs) All your good, all that kale. All those good intentions. And so, you know, if you are eating kale and salads and you're... But you're not meditating. (laughs) And you're stressed out, either because of stress in your life or because your food choices are stressing you out. Mm. which that happens, I see that every single day as well. I could see it, yeah. Then it's not going to do you a lick of good. So we need to to work on those stress levels. And stress affects inflammation as well. So it's all tied together. Good. It affects our blood sugar, which affects our hormones, 
It affects our sleep, which affects our hormones. <laughs> it's all connected. Yes. Which yes. really proves once again that mind, body, spirit connection and the bi-directional feedback loop between all of them are interlooping systems. And so when one area is off, we're going to definitely see issues in other areas. And this is why I love holistic practitioners like yourself, because we're, we are taking a look above just the pharmacology of it to what are some easier things that we could try tackling? Does it mean we may not always end up with a medical intervention? However, I mean, shit, if I had had someone like you that been like, girl, go take you a walk, meditate, (laughs) try and, you know, make some better food choices, you might see a reduction in some of the symptoms. For me, I did have adenomyosis and I chose to follow my doctor's advice and have an endometrial ablation after my second one. And then later was like, you know, I wonder if I could have held off because that that meant the end of babies. And while I thought I was okay with that in my late twenties, you know, now hitting 40, I may have made a different decision. Right. Right. And who knows, I may still have ended up with that, but just having had someone else around me that went, you know, there's a lot of other things interacting with your hormones that we can take a look at first could have been useful. Yeah, absolutely. And like, you know, it might not have taken the pain. It might not have brought the pain to zero. Right. But if you could go from a 10 to a five or from a seven to a three. And also potentially manageable. Yeah, absolutely. Mm, That's amazing. So I want to tackle one final topic with you before I let you go. And that is back over to the social justice thing. So As a therapist that specializes in sex and gender issues, I was so thrilled to see that you talk about people outside of the cisgendered binary, (laughs) which really hits home for me because a lot of my trans men or bi-gendered men or agendered or gender fluid, gender queer, all of that, they still menstruate until they perhaps later choose, but some don't, to have a full hysterectomy. And it can be incredibly dysphoria-inducing. So all the things that us cisgendered women are facing, they're experiencing 10 times over. Mm -hmm. And so if they don't have accessibility, right, to products, or they don't have their own bathrooms, et cetera, this becomes an even bigger issue. So talk to me about some of the things that you and your colleagues are thinking of and and why people listening who have never given a thought to someone outside the binary continuum should. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, my caveat to this part of the conversation is that, you know, I'm a cisgendered woman. Right. And so, you know, I'm not coming at this from personal experience. but you know, I strive to be inclusive in my work and that's inclusive of all bodies, right? Mm -hmm. And that includes bodies that don't fit into that gender binary. And, you know, I feel really passionate about that because, because it's just the right thing to do. People matter, damn it. Like, exactly. I don't have a, I don't have like a, a well thought out answer to this. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when I I started practicing as a holistic nutritionist and I started to, you know, just take a, take stock of the lay of the land. And the first time I came across, I I don't even remember the first time I came across a transgendered man or a Mm -hmm. non-binary person who was talking about menstruation. Like to me, it was just a no brainer. I was like, Oh, okay. You'd write. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that must be awful. That's shitty. Yeah. And, is. you know, it, it's also oftentimes when we get into this conversation around menstruation, and certainly this is true for when we're talking to young people, we say, you're a woman now. Yeah. Right? And mm-hmm. when I started to really dig in, especially when I was writing my book, this was a question that really nagged at me, which was, is your period what makes you a woman? Mm. And certainly in some communities in men- the menstrual activism world, there's a lot of people who tie menstruation to the divine feminine or to 
you know, a divine power. Right. And they really see menstruation as being kind of central to their gender identity, or at least definitely a big part of that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, at times, I have felt that too, right? Right. But then as I started researching and looking at all of these pieces and overturning all these stones, right? Well, if menstruation is what makes you a woman, then what about all these people who are on hormonal birth control who aren't menstruating? Right? <laughs> are they women? Uh, what, about, what about women or people who have reached menopause? Are you suddenly, no, you're just no longer a woman anymore when you are in menopause? Or what if you have a hysterectomy? What if you don't menstruate because of a health condition? Or trauma or anything, yeah. Exactly. And there are just, like, it's just too, it's too binary to say menstruation is what makes you a woman, right? It is. And so it really, and, you know, I still question this all the time, right? Like, you know, I wrote this book in the last year and I don't know if I got it right. (laughs) I don't know. I, I feel like I'm always growing and learning and thinking and unpacking in this area. But it costs me nothing to use inclusive language in my podcast, in my book, and on my website. It costs me absolutely Mm -hmm. nothing to be sensitive to these issues. And I consider myself to be a feminist. And to me, that means being inclusive of non-binary people and trans people and people of color and different bodies, right? Because when right. when we lift, when I work to lift those marginalized groups up and I use my cisgendered nice white lady privilege mm-hmm. to be inclusive and to lift those other marginalized groups up, then we'll all do better. I love it. I could not have said it better myself. <laughs> Thank you for that. I don't that. know. That one caught me off guard, Tamara. <laughs> I know. That's my job. <laughs> not on purpose, but sometimes I you know, I'm like, oh, that sparks an interest for me. Let's follow that rabbit trail. And it's usually to really great places and things that need to be said. Because I think this is where language is both powerful and not helpful at all, depending upon what side of the coin you fall on. Because because we're taking an approach about, you know, perhaps the divine feminine, I think there could be an entire other podcast episode that you and I have about, you know, the red tents that we used to have as sisters and perhaps how the shame wasn't as they're now pre-Christianity and patriarchal cultures, et cetera. But at the same time, (laughs) we now in modern days do allow for in certain uh, certain sections of the world have never had an issue with gender. However, the United States and Canada being one that did. (laughs) Yeah. Now we are having these important conversations again and looking to our trans men and our non-binary friends and loved ones in general and saying, I see you and I want to be respectful of you and your body and whatever feels appropriate to you. So it's a both and I think it's Mm -hmm. nice to see, but bottom line, we, we treat people the way they, they need to be treated the way they ask to be treated. Yeah, absolutely. And on that note, you know, you talk about kind of the power, but also the limitations of language. This is something that I feel like I struggle with every single day in putting out my work because You know, often people who work in this space will call themselves a women's health expert, right? Mm -hmm. And when you see a women's health or, uh, you know, when you, when my book is available, you'll go into the bookstore. Well, that'll be in women's health. You'll you'll (laughs) navigate to the section on the, because it goes on Amazon. Yeah. (laughs) Um, It, you know, it falls into women's health and, you know, very early on when I was kind of working on my branding and growing my nutrition practice, like that really didn't feel right to me. Mm -hmm. But I still struggle with the language because oftentimes, you know, in the menstrual space, people will use the term menstruators or people will say people with uteruses, Mm -hmm. right? And, you know, these are terms that are gender non-binary, right? They're not gender terms. Mm -hmm. So, and I use them, right? From Mm -hmm. time to time, but I'm still uncomfortable with them because my whole work is around 
you know, your menstrual cycle is more than just your period and it's important to your overall health and wellness. And from that holistic point of view, it feels so reductive to then just call somebody a menstruator. Like it's just a, like, you know, as a holistic nutritionist, I don't refer to my clients as poopers. Right. When I'm working with them on digestion, right? Or having babies breeders. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, so, you know, it's still something that I really struggle with and I'm learning. I just, I hope that, you know, people can see that I'm learning mm-hmm. and I'm trying to create a safe space or a brave space where we can say, I don't know, I don't have all the answers. I don't know what's right. I'm going to try this on. I'm going to try that on. I'm trying. And I think that's all that matters for any of us. And I know that I have to let you go because you've got somewhere to be and we have just barely scratched the surface. So we may have to have you back on to talk about some of these awesome rabbit trails. But you do offer holistic deep dive consultations for people who could use the service of all types. I'm like, what am I going to call them? Menstruators? (laughs) Women? No. (laughs) Endocrinology health? It goes beyond even that in your one-on-one session. So tell people how they can find you and work with you, including getting your books. I know you've got a wait list for it, right? Yeah, for sure. So my website is amandalaird.ca. And that's the best place to find the podcast. You can subscribe to my newsletter, from my website and you will be the first to know about pre-orders. The book will be out February 23rd, 2019 in Canada and March 19th, 2019 in the U.S. Um, And I'll have some fun pre-order stuff coming out in the new year in early 2019. So if you get on my email list, you'll get that. And yes, I do see clients one-on-one. I offer 90-minute period coaching sessions, gives us lots of time for me to listen and to take your concerns seriously. And we will talk about understanding your cycle, decoding your symptoms. We'll talk about nutrition. We'll talk about lifestyle stuff. And if you need it, we'll also put together a plan for how you can advocate for yourself and navigate the medical system, which is not always kind to no. menstrual issues. And so helpful. I'm already thinking of a lot of clients who do have endometriosis, adenomyosis, PCOS, all of that. This would be super useful for. And I do those online too. Mm -hmm. So they're online sessions. And I will have links to all of that so you don't have to pull over right now and try and write that down quick so you can just hit grab it in the show notes. Amanda, thank you so much for this. This was a wealth of treasure information. Thank you. I loved being here. for listening to the Sacred Psychology Podcast. I pray you found some inspiration and empowerment to go out and make this life the most fulfilling possible. You can follow Sacred Psychology on Facebook and YouTube. If you haven't yet, please go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Tag us on social media and let us know what you think as well. Please note that the information provided is not meant to convey professional, psychological, or medical advice. If you could use such services, I highly recommend seeking them out from someone you trust. To get in touch with me personally or to see how we might work together, please check out ariatherapy.com or talesfromatrapezoid.com. Until next time, everyone.